Our next lame, named lectureship is the Eugene J. Van Scott Award for Innovative Therapy of Skin and Fo Philip Frost Leadership Lecture. Established in 2006, this award and lecture were made possible by a generous donation from Dr. Philip Frost, Emeritus Clinical Professor of Dermatology at the University of Miami School of Medicine and former chairman of the de Dermatology Department at Mount Sinai Medical Center in Miami Beach. Dr. Frost named the award after his mentor, Dr. Eugene J. Van Scott, with whom he worked at the National Institutes of Health early in his career. It is my privilege to introduce the recipient of the 2019 Eugene J. Van Scott Award for Innovation Therapy of the Skin and Philip Frost Lectureship, uh, Leadership Lecture is Dr. Paul Neum. Dr. Neum is the George F. Odland Endowed Chair and Head of the Division of Dermatology at the University of Washington in Seattle. He sees patients at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance and is an affiliate investigator at Fred Hutchinson Center Research Center. He grew up in Olympia, Washington, attended Harvard College, and then pursued MD and PhD degrees at Stanford University, where he studied cancer biology and immunology. He did his medicine internship at Brigham and Women's Hospital, followed by dermatology residency at Mass General Hospital. That means that he was one of my residents, and the two of us can't believe we're here together today. In 2003, he started his own lab at the Cutaneous Biology Research Center at Massachusetts General Hospital in 1996. As a dermatology resident, he saw a man with a firm lesion on the lip that turned out to be his first case of Merkel cell carcinoma. He was later encouraged by Dr. Harley Haynes to write a book chapter on this seemingly obscure topic. Surprisingly, MCC patients began coming regularly to this clinic to help with this complicated cancer. And today he leads a multidisciplinary team focused on improving management of Merkel cell cancer. Given his lifelong uh, uh, interest in cancer biology and immunology, Dr. Neum feels incredibly fortunate to study a disease in which cancer immunology can improve the care of patients. Paul, we look forward to your message. Good morning. Wow. Thank you very much. Um, this is a big deal. And not just because it's a huge honor for me personally and a career highlight, which it absolutely is, but also because in the next few minutes, I believe we can accomplish something that's going to be truly meaningful. Not just that I get to tell you a few cool stories of what I think is a fascinating disease, and these stories have come out very recently, but because Together, with some 2,500 dermatologists here this morning, we're going to impact lives. Because discoveries do not matter if they're not applied. And right now, as you all know, Merkel cell carcinoma is a pretty obscure disease. And I think the vast majority of Merkel cell carcinoma patients are simply not getting optimal care. What is optimal care? It is up-to-date, multidisciplinary, consultation, and that is not happening in nearly enough patients. So today, very simply, in addition to some, I think, cool and fascinating stories, I want to give you a couple of tools that you will need when that biopsy comes up in 6 or 12 or 18 months for you or one of your colleagues that you thought was a cyst and looked like a cyst, but turns out to be the pathologist says, a Merkel cell carcinoma, you will have the tools to know what to do to make sure that patient gets the same care that I believe you all would get if that was on you or a family member. So with that, I'm happy to address the topic today of less toxic and more effective, a win-win for Merkel cell carcinoma patients. Here are my relevant disclosures. Um, I have worked with these companies to help them bring uh, therapies to rare cancers. 
and I want to give you the outline as we are moving towards less toxic and more effective care for these patients. Okay, uh, I'll give you a brief uh, disease overview and then tell you three stories. Number one about surgery. And this was the trickiest thing as I prepared for this talk. There is not a simple answer about the right way to treat Merkel cell carcinoma surgically. And I think actually this talk forced me to try to do that. And I think I've come up with kind of a pretty clear answer. We do not just treat this cancer, although we know it's a dangerous cancer, with wide margins without thought. They need to be wise margins integrated in a multidisciplinary way in often, in many cases, with radiation. The second story will be about surveillance. For a cancer that has a 40% chance of coming back among all comers, that is obviously huge. It's not sufficient what we are told now in the national guidelines, which is surveillance should be as indicated as clinically indicated. And now we have emerging data on the recurrence frequency as a function of stage and a new blood test just indicated in the NCCN guidelines this year that really can improve our ability to track this cancer and catch those diseases recurrences early when we can make a difference with the third story, which is systemic therapy. And this, I think you're all aware of, a huge Pro bit of progress moving from chemotherapy, which offered a 5% or less chance of controlling the disease for one year or more once it had become advanced to a tenfold improvement in, in that using immunotherapy. And then the, the most important message is what is the role of the dermatologist here? And very simply, and I'll, I'll give you tools and I'll give you examples, but it is to advocate multidisciplinary care. No one, absolutely not including me, can take care of these patients by themselves. You need input from surgery, medical oncology, radiation therapy, and ideally updated data from research to take care of these patients. And dermatologists are in the perfect situation to push the patient to get that and to take care of them in a longitudinal way because we're going to be following them over time for their skin cancers. So I'll start with a disease overview and just tell you why is it important. Well, it's about five times more likely to kill a patient on average than is melanoma. And that everybody knows. It's aggressive, quote unquote aggressive. So there you are pushed then to have therapies that have often very high morbidity, such as aggressive surgery, mutilating sometimes, um, uh, a lot of radiation, frequent scans with radiation and uh, uh, CT uh, contrast dye toxicity, and infusions of chemotherapy and or immunotherapies. So we have to balance these, these issues carefully. And of course, then there is an increasing incidence, which I was quite surprised at the magnitude of uh, recently when we looked in detail. Here is the increasing incidence as a function of all cancer cases, percent increase um, in 2000. These are the solid tumors with a modest increase over that 13-year period of about 15%. As we are all aware, melanoma is going up significantly faster than cancer in general, but Merkel cell carcinoma is going up yet quite a bit faster than that. And here is the observed rate, here is the projected rate over the next decade, and it's very clear why that is the case. And that is the striking relationship of Merkel cell carcinoma to age. Here is the relationship of age to all cancers. And you see it coming up in the 40s and 50s and 60s and falling down as a percent of all cases as we get older. For Merkel cell carcinoma, there is a bizarre and stunning shift to the right, delayed by a decade or two, and just keeps going up with age. I am confident at least a part of that is due to immune senescence and the fact that our immune system cannot see this immunogenic cancer and control it as well as we get older. Here's something that all of you probably know. The diagnosis clinically of Merkel cell carcinoma is very difficult. And there simply are no specific features. Our AEIOU system uh, is somewhat sensitive to find one, but it's, most of those are not going to be Merkel cell carcinomas. Most are just going to be thought to be benign. I mean, this red nodule or even a skin-colored nodule on the abdomen, you're going to think this is a cyst. Unless that, you know, you put together, it's a non-tender nodule, it's rapidly growing in red and on sun-exposed skin in an older patient, then clearly it deserves a biopsy, but still most of those are not going to be Merkel cell carcinomas. So the reality is, 
where we're going to make an impact for these patients is not on trying to find them early. It's on what we do once that surprising pathology result comes back. And Suzanne mentioned that my life was changed when I saw one case of Merkel cell carcinoma when I was a derm resident. That is the only time I have seen a primary unsuspected Merkel cell carcinoma. It's just not that common. When you get that surprising result, you need to know what to do, and that's what we're going to talk about. So the first story is surgery, um, moving from wide to wise margins, plus or minus radiation, and I'll start with a case. This fellow had a average size, 1.6 centimeter Merkel cell carcinoma on his left wrist here, and he got what we are often told, and I'm told this is on the boards right now, you need wide margins for Merkel cell carcinoma, totally standard. Two centimeter margins were possible, it leaves a six centimeter problem, and a skin graft was placed, very standard. The sentinel node was negative. Unfortunately, the deep margin was very close, and we knew this guy would need radiation. And the big surgery here and the big graft meant that healing wasn't ready for radiation for five months. And that was a big delay. And then a few months later, he developed a recurrence in his left axilla and clearly experienced the worst of all worlds. He's got surgical morbidity, he's got radiation morbidity, and he's got the cancer coming back. So what do we do? What is the right margin? And this is a big struggle, and there is not a simple answer. This graph, um, uh, and this study led by Erica and Teresa, shows what about a dozen other studies have shown in the left panel so far. And that is if you do not give local radiation, your ability to control the local recurrence of Merkel cell carcinoma stinks compared to any other type of skin cancer. I will note that all seven of these recurring patients who had microscopic negative margins, what we have not separated in the literature is this very important thing. And that is, if you're going to give radiation, and these are not small numbers, this is 70 patients in each arm, if you're going to give radiation, margins become irrelevant. Many of these patients had pathologically positive margins. We typically get clinical margins, but they're path positive margins, and again, Merkel is a cancer that jumps. As I told you, all seven of these recurrences had path negative margins. So you can't be very confident um, in, in many cases. So which patients don't need radiation? What are low risk tumors? Well, ideally, each of these six factors would be negative in order to not give radiation. This is a small primary, less than a centimeter, margins uh, negative pathologically, no lymphovascular invasion, uh, no profound immune suppression, sentinel node negative, and not on the head and neck. All of those things, head and neck is a higher risk location. All of those things, if they're met, we feel very comfortable not radiating. Generally across the country, across thousands of patients, about half will get local radiation. And I was surprised to find in our cohort, where we just looked a week or so ago, that 92% of our patients ended up getting radiation locally. So what do we do? Should everybody mindlessly get a wide excision? Absolutely not. It depends on the context. And part of the trick here, and why it's so hard to summarize, is that the decision to give radiation or not depends on data that you get on the day of re-excision. You are missing on that date whether the sentinel node is positive or negative, and you're missing, obviously, what the pathologic margins are going to be for the surgery you're about to do. So the simple answer is right here you should go for primary closure. You can go as wide as you want, but you need primary closure because then you can move, if you need to, to radiation promptly. It lowers the morbidity. You avoid this kind of six-month mess, and re-excision can always be done later if you're going to say, we don't need radiation, we just need wider margins. So in summary, the local treatment approach requires multidisciplinary discussion. The best initial re-excision margin is wide, but primarily closed. And radiation can provide superb local control, even if the margins are microscopically positive. So the next topic is about surveillance. Again, we have a 40% chance of recurring for all comers in this cancer. And we are now given these guidelines of just follow them as clinically indicated. Too frequent of surveillance leads to toxicity of scans, unnecessary visits, and a lot of extra costs. And too infrequent, we miss the early diagnosis. We lose the time window to treat this cancer, which is now increasingly important and in many cases treatable, even if it's metastatic. We have had 
uh, survival data in this cancer, but we have not had recurrence data. That's trickier, and the national, guide, the national uh, uh, data sets do not capture recurrence. So we have now made these data available at our website, and I'll mention our website several times, MerkelCell.org. All the information in this lecture is there and freely available, written in ways that we think are clear for patients as well as docs, and this is the recurrence, not death. Um, and this is why you would watch a patient, for example, Mrs. Smith here, who might come back at year six, and we use these curves for every time we see a patient come back because they're so different from each other as a function of stage and time. Mrs. Smith coming back at year six for a pathologic stage one, we can tell her, you're ready to graduate from our program. There's almost no more risk of you having a recurrence. In contrast, if Mr. Jones comes back here at year one after a pathologic stage 3B Merkel cell carcinoma, we know we've got to be following him very closely uh, and, uh, and, and it's going to be a while before he's on the, the flat part of this curve with no more risk. In addition to these data, science is also helping us with our surveillance goals. And I'd like to give you two background slides. One, I think everybody in this room should be aware of in 2008, a human virus that causes Merkel cell carcinoma was discovered by Patrick Moore and Yuan Chang, a dynamic husband and wife duo that also discovered the Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus in the 1990s. Their initial observation that this new polyomavirus was present in eight of 10 Merkel cell carcinomas has been validated in dozens of studies and thousands of patients around the world. And we have a funky conundrum here that the virus is incredibly common, as it turns out. There's childhood exposure for all of us. It's on the doorknobs in the daycare centers, and yet it caught, and on our normal skin in many cases, and yet it causes no direct problems. Uh, and only yet one in 3,000 people will have their, as a lifetime risk, will develop Merkel cell carcinoma. So how does such a common virus cause such a rare cancer? And we now have answer to that very clearly. Again, 80% in the U.S. are caused by the Merkel virus here on the left in pink, and 20% are caused by sunlight. In Australia, the ratio is flipped, where they have so many people with fair skin and lots of sun exposure, and you get lots of sun-induced Merkels. But here, we now know the rarity of this cancer is caused by two crazy rare events being required in terms of the virus that normally don't happen. Number one, the virus must integrate into one of our chromosomes, and number two, it must be truncated here, otherwise the cancer cell, the precancer cell, will immediately be killed. Um, and then, if the immune system is evaded in terms of viral proteins, uh, then there is um, uh, a Merkel cell carcinoma that looks exactly the same clinically and histologically as one induced by sunlight. In this case, the sunlight takes out a variety of proteins and functions, including the retinoblastoma protein, many cases leaving scars behind in the form of UV mutated proteins. And the important thing about this, the take home message from this slide is that both causes are visible to T cells and a amenable to therapy now. And the other important message here is that antibodies that are derived to these proteins, the, onco, the viral oncoproteins, are very useful in this test that I'd like to tell you about now very briefly. It was just newly indicated in the NCCN guidelines in 2018. And basically, at baseline, when any patient comes in at diagnosis, we believe it's indicated and useful to get one blood test that tells you whether they make antibodies or not to this polyomavirus. Those and half of patients will not, that do not make those antibodies, are at a higher risk of having the cancer come back, 42%, and they must be tracked closely with scans because there is no blood test. In contrast, for the seropositive patients, you can get away with few, far fewer scans, and because you can follow them with this blood test that is performing extremely well. So it works this way. You get the baseline, and this is, again, only for the half that make the antibodies. Three months later, you check what has happened to the antibody titer. And if it's gone down, there is an incredibly strong and predictive, uh, you know, uh, verification that the cancer is not coming back at that time. This is data from 774 patients over a decade um, and over 2,000 uh, blood tests. In contrast, if there's been an increase at this time or any subsequent time, you have almost 100% chance that the cancer is coming back then or will come back in a few months in a way that's detectable. The details of how to do this are either on MerkelCell.org or any of this stuff. You can just Google. 
Merkel blood test, for example. So here's the summary for this concept, the surveillance. The current guidelines just say use common sense, and uh, that's not enough, I believe. We now have the avail availability of recurrence and staging data that can clearly improve uh, with evidence how often we are scanning and uh, having these patients come back. And this blood test for recurrence is more reliable, less toxic, far less expensive, more than tenfold less expensive, and offers earlier detection than does traditional imaging. So the final story is systemic therapy. I think many of you know about this. And why would you explore immunotherapy in Merkel cell carcinoma? Well, we knew for many years that this cancer is much increased in people with profound ongoing T cell dysfunction. HIV is the reason this virus was first discovered. They looked in that population and found the polyoma virus. As I told you, non-self immunogenic T cell targets are present in both the virus positive and virus negative Merkels. And CD8 T cells, if they're present, and that's only a minority of tumors, but if they're present in good numbers within the tumor, among 300 patients, not one died. So that was really strong evidence to suggest that T cells are playing an important role. And finally, we and others carried out specific studies of Merkel cell polyomavirus specific T cells and found them present in the blood and tumors and that they appeared exhausted. So here is the Nobel Prize 2018. I think you all know about the brakes and the accelerators in red and green here of the T cell response for which Jim Allison and Tasuku Honjo received this prize. And it was pretty gratifying to read the Nobel citation and note that the Merkel studies that we carried out within our humble dermatology uh, studies were cited as reason for giving this award. Here are the data. This panel focuses on the patients with ongoing response. A lot of patients initially respond to chemotherapy, and that's what the medical oncologist always told us. The issue was the responses were not durable. And I'm going to show you pembrolizumab, anti-PD-1, and versus chemotherapy. And other of these drugs work essentially the same, but we happened to do our main study on pembrolizumab and look at if you responded to pembrolizumab, here is your chance of staying in response out to three years and look at what is happening with chemotherapy. Admittedly, this was not randomized, but this is an enormous difference and it cannot be accounted for by simple minor confounding factors. If you don't buy durability, here's just, was the patient alive at this time point? And you can see at these time points, pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy, a huge difference once again. Many fold better chance of surviving. So this has led to two drugs being approved in the past year or two for Merkel cell carcinoma. Rapid changes in the NCSCN guidelines within two years, flipping to say chemo only to immunotherapy greatly pre preferred. I want to shift now to the very important role of the dermatologist, which is to advocate for multidisciplinary and longitudinal care. And I like to think of myself as an orchestra conductor because I don't, and the dermatologist doesn't, do the wide excision and sentinel lymph node biopsy. We don't radiate, we don't infuse chemotherapy and immunotherapy, but we play a very important role in ensuring the care is multidisciplinary, current, and that we integrate these important factors from the patient, their age, their comorbidities, morbidities, ability to travel, and their personal preferences. This is what you need to do. You need to make sure that your patient gets a consult from one of these multidisciplinary centers. The full list is maintained on our website. We make sure that these people function multidisciplinary in a multidisciplinary way and interact quickly and responsively, nationally and internationally. Here is the key web source. Uh, it's a site that we created. It's the number one site if you just Google or Bing Merkel cell carcinoma, over 100,000 visitors per year, and it includes everything we covered today, patient-friendly explanations and all those referral centers and more. Or there's just good old-fashioned email. Um, there's my email and or our team, and we are happy to help you or your patients get to the resources that they need. So in summary, the incidence of this cancer is increasing. It is 
exciting to be proposing and, and, and now have less toxic, more effective therapies in the range of surgery where primary closure needs to be the paramount thing initially, surveillance where uh, we have better data and a blood test and systemic therapy has moved from immunotherapy to chemotherapy and your role is extremely important here. I want to thank mentors here. Tom Cupper, Harley Haynes were my mentors when this project started, and wonderful trainees in all zones of medical students, research scientists, and undergrads, and a number of dermatologist trainees, many of whom are here today. If you stand up now, I would, that would be wonderful. You could be um, recognized by the people around you. I think there's a, a handful here. Thank you. donors um, and, uh, and uh, our, our funding sources. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Paul. On behalf of the Academy, I'd like to present you with this award, recognizing your outstanding achievement. <laughs>